Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy, never normal shift going on all around us. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever changing convergence of people, business, and technology. Here is your host, Ira Wolf. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. This is the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, technology, and people. Well, this is the first live show of our seventh season. It's hard to believe. 2018 is when we started. Living up to our Googleization theme of adapting at the speed of change, you'll probably notice a few changes of our own. First of all, Jason Cochran, my co-host and friend for the last two and a half years, is not by my virtual side. Jason was offered an opportunity to do what he and I talk about every week for the last three years, or actually last six years. Uh, we helped, He left for an opportunity to help businesses implement uh, in better creating a better employee experience and life for all workers. So we wish the best for Jason, and I'm sure he'll be back at some point. Unfortunately, his schedule didn't permit the opportunity to do it now, so I'll be hosting solo. But change always opens up new opportunities, and not being one to hesitate to walk through those doors, sometimes burst through those doors, I decided to change up the format a bit. Instead of two hosts interviewing one guest, we're going to have one guest or one host interviewing two guests on many of the shows. And this week, we have an all-star duo featuring Geek Skeezers and Googleization alumni, Gad Levin. And I think this is his third, maybe his fourth time. Uh, Gad is the chief economist at Burning Glass Institute and Dr. Christopher Boric, director of the Institute of Public Opinion at Muhlenberg College. I can't think of two better people to explore the impacts of AI, a booming economy, uh, presidential election, uh, what everything that's going on, uh, and, and certainly the election is shaping up to be controversial and one of the most critical ones in the history of the U.S. So you're going to want to stay right where you are. Uh, you might, might also have noticed that our virtual cha stage changed a bit. Uh, when I started Geek Skeezers and Googleization back in 2018, uh, my co-host with Keith, Keith Capagna, our first home was for W4CY Radio. We were just doing audio at the time. Well, we took a break for about three years, but now we came back as they grew and they entered the video world and we've been doing video for a while. So in addition to broadcasting live on our usual platforms like LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, we're now live on W4CY and Talk4 TV. Uh, we're reaching a potential audience of almost 2 million people through all the platforms that we're on. So the video replays will continue to be available on all the usual platforms, uh, such as Roku, Apple, Spotify, or wherever and however you listen to podcasts. To make it easy to watch each week on W4CY on your mobile devices, simply download the W4CY app on whichever platform you're using, or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, W4CY's or mine at Ira Wolf, and you will get notified when we go live. Before we get to this week's guests, it's time for the perfect labor story. This is the segment I get to bring to your attention a disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that I believe you should know. Well, according to PwC's 27th Annual Global CEO Survey, released just about three weeks ago, nearly 45% of global CEOs believe their companies would no longer be viable in 10 years if they continued on their perfect on their current path. Just a few years ago, just one year ago, it was only 40%. So there's a 10% increase in just one year that they don't think that the pace of change is going to allow them to be economically viable, uh, again, a decade from now. 
The number is even more discouraging for companies generating revenues of under $100 million. I believe it was over 55%. Don't believe they'll be around. So, and a few months earlier, McKinsey released its state of organizations report, and the forecast wasn't much better, uh, especially for managers who are waiting for change to slow down for them to catch up. Only 5%, that's correct, five single digits of respondents said their organizations have the capabilities that they need. So glad we've got these two experts on to help us figure that out, what they need to do. Uh, McKinsey calls it a, ca a capability chasm, and a chasm it is. Part of the reason might be because leadership feels that between 20 and 30 percent of critical roles in their organizations aren't filled by the appropriate people. And finally, more than one third of leaders listed managing immediate immediate crisis or getting the same work done with fewer resources is a top priority. That means deploying resources, including people where they matter the most efficiently and quickly. That requires adaptability, what you've heard me talk about for the last four years as high IQ, AQ, high AQ. But studies show that only one out of four employees have high AQ, high enough to keep up with the accelerating pace of change we're experiencing. And that Googleization nation is why I've been warning about the perfect labor storm for the last 25 years. Well, it's now time for many of those companies to pay the piper who didn't respond, which leads me into why we're here today. Gad Levinen is chief economic economist of the Burning Glass Institute. He previously was with the conference board where, where I met him, uh, where he was the founder of the Labor Market Institute. His research focuses on trends in the U.S. and global labor markets, the U.S. economy, and their impact on employers. Gad's one of my favorite connections on LinkedIn. I encourage you to connect with him because almost every day, if not more than once a day, Gad offers a steady diet of data-driven stats and trends about jobs, labor, and the economy that are just mind-blowing. He, he does magic with these numbers. Dr. Christopher Boric is a professor of political science and director of the Muhlenberg College Institute of Public Opinion. In his career, he's conducted over 300 national, state, and regional public opinion surveys, and he's been and he provided analysis for the BBC, NPR, CBS News, CNN, NBC Nightly News, and many others. As a director of the institute, Chris is a pretty popular guy, as you can imagine, these days during the election. So I'm really pleased he's agreed to join us. Welcome, Gad and Chris. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Laura. It's an absolute pleasure to be to be with you. And I like yeah. that you your lead in included lots of survey data. It made me feel at home. <laughs> yeah, and and Gad, Gad, a, a numbers guy. We get we got numbers people here. So um, so stay tuned. So again, I, I know you both got uh, tons of things on your plates. So I really appreciate you being here. Plus, uh, you know, I always I enjoy talking to both of you. Uh, let's start out this way. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of questions. You know, we're uh, the title of the show um, I, I, is always difficult to come up with something that summarizes it. But it's sort of, you know, the po policy, public opinion and business. Are these ships passing in the night? And sometimes it absolutely sees it is that way just down the hall from you, Chris. Uh, yesterday, I was teaching uh, in the innovation and entrepreneurship class, uh, and they showed the discrepancy between the pace of change, uh, how uh, different uh, segments keep up. And, you know, public policy seems to be almost a flat line where technology is almost this hockey stick. It's almost a vertical line going up at the pace of, you know, how quickly things are changing. And then, you know, individuals and business somewhere fall, you know, in between. Um, so lots to talk about. Uh, so I only want to get into the election a little bit, but let's just start out easy. We're six weeks into 2024. What's the most surprising thing you've seen or, or experienced so far this year? Uh, or, you know, what's the biggest takeaway you have what you've seen so far this year? Sure. I'll, either, either one. I'll, I'll let it <laughs> go ahead, Gat. I'm happy to, to go. Um, 
Well, it's not a huge surprise, but uh, I think most of uh, the indicators that came so far uh, this year are suggesting that the, the U.S. economy is grow even, growing even faster than expected. And there's no sign of recession and, and, and very rapid and strong growth. The uh, U.S. is outpacing more, most other advanced economies for quite a while now. Um, so that's kind of strong 2024 and potentially uh, problems for the Fed uh, in their quest to lower interest rates. Yeah, we'll yeah. come back to that because I'm curious why that's going to, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that. Why you think that was, a, why the, why that's going to be a problem. It seems that that's um, everybody else is sort of excited and looking forward to it. So, Chris, sorry, didn't want to interrupt you there. No, no, Ira, and I love, I love where Gad. I was, was kind of headed in the same direction. I mean, the the persistence of the of the positive macroeconomic news um, as we've entered twenty twenty four um, is is pretty um, pretty staggering, right? And as we move into an election year, and of course, political economy, the relationship between economics and and politics um, is is very much on my mind. Uh, as we move forward, you know, to, to, to simplify a, a very incredibly complex political and economic environment, we've traditionally seen positive macroeconomic indicators deliver uh, success to incumbent presidents trying to, to reach uh, a, a second term. You know, we know Joe, Joe Biden's trying to do that right now. Uh, the big question is, is the, does a history of that uh, relationship uh uh, still hold in 2024 in this changed world that that you talk about so, so often. Uh, will will history once again establish that? Yeah, you know, I could model this. Good economic indicators like the ones uh, Gad just mentioned. Um, uh, will they will they hold in terms of of actually uh, you know being a powerful force for for reelection or are we, have we moved into something different, which a lot of people are asking me about. So. That's kind of yeah. takeaways as the start of the year. Yeah. So sticking with the economy a little bit, let's talk about a year ago, Gad. Um, you were on. Uh, you were on a couple times, um, and, and we, we, we were, we were everyone. And I don't know if this was included you, but we also have work with the Odeon Capital Group, and they're on quarterly, and we talk about the prediction was, or the the, the most. Diff, I won't say the choice. The options were soft landing. Or a recession. Okay, here we are a year later, and we've got a booming GDP. Um, we've got a, a an incredibly um, the stock market is going crazy. Um, labor numbers just the other day came out to three hundred and forty thousand new jobs. Um, that doesn't seem like we're talking soft landing or recession anymore. Uh, and you know, which goes back to what you were talking about, Chris. Uh, with the economy. I mean, that should just be a lock for Biden. Um, and again, we don't want to go into, we're not political choices. We're just talking about this, but that should in history be a lock for that. No brainer. And it's not. Uh, Gad, we're, I guess with all the numbers and all the forecasting and all the trends in, and we talk about this being in completely VUCA time, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, how did, so many people get it wrong. I think uh, the U.S. consumer, I would say that's uh, <laughs> part of the, you should never underestimate the willingness of the U.S. <laughs> consumer to consume. Uh, that, that was uh, probably um, uh, the, just kept on consuming and uh, seems to be continuing to consume uh, and growing consumption uh, significantly. Um, I do think that uh, one of the positive surprises that I inflation came down faster uh, than most expected, uh, faster than I expected. I still wouldn't like uh, celebrate yet. I think uh, it's not clear that um, we are safely at uh, around 2%, which is the Fed's target for inflation, uh, and especially with such a strong employment growth, as you mentioned the labor market is likely to remain tight and, and wage growth is also still well above pre-pandemic uh, levels. Uh, so um, so that uh, could also threaten the inflation target. 
Yeah, so, uh, and going, there was a question that just flew out of my head there, Gad. <laughs> um, so, you know, as we talk about uh, the, the labor markets, um, and, and you just did a really nice piece talking about the regional differences as well. So again, yeah. uh, when we talk about, and, and Chris, this certainly falls in, in your world with, with public opinion, and, and you know, I know you've done a lot of work in the state of Pennsylvania uh, with surveys. Uh, we'll, we'll talk, we can talk about uh, something that you just released back uh, about six weeks ago, maybe, or so, uh, the discrepancies. But, you know, it's it, going back to, to James Carville's uh, uh, description of Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, we had uh, Philadelphia, um, uh, Ohio, or uh, Philadelphia, the Midwest, and Kentucky. <laughs> they were like the three regions of, of Pennsylvania. Um, and here we are, um, you know, so there's wide differences even within our state discrepancies. Um, but Gad, you've, you've just published some data on the huge discrepancies regionally uh, with people that are, are being are thriving, but some are being left behind. Uh, and it's not only within regions, it's within a lot of demographics. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you ask people how you feel about the, the economy, it's not just about kind of the business cycles, whether the overall economy is growing and whether unemployment rate is high or low. It's kind of uh, when they answer this question, they think uh, long term and there are several areas in, in this country that are kind of on a, in a constant decline relative to other parts of the country. And I would say the Midwest uh, is uh, especially uh, coming to mind. It used to be a, a region that was richer than the average, uh, and now it is gradually declining in the, uh, and it's now well below uh, the average um, state in the country. Uh, so there is massive uh, uh, migration out of those areas. So if you are live there, even if you have a job and uh, you're personally uh, doing well, you're definitely impacted by the surroundings, by uh, communities being depleted, uh, by missing out uh, on uh, tech, for example. Tech is um, especially strong in the West, but there is also uh, in other uh, uh, rising in other places, but uh, the Midwest is kind of, a, it skipped the Midwest for the most part. So I think there are very important areas, especially areas that uh, were Republican, I would say battleground uh, states, uh, where um, they are significantly feeling more uh, left behind than they used to, uh, which could have uh, important implications for the elections. Yeah, I mean, that seems a little odd because I know um, like Arizona is, you know, certainly one of those states um, yet, you know, that Intel has been there for years. And now they're talking about building, you know, a lot of other, you know, facilities there as well. Texas, um, you know, is, is there. I'm not sure that's a battle. I mean, it is an important state, but I'm not sure that's a battleground state. You, know, you can certainly see that in the Wisconsin's. But Pennsylvania's really there's a lot of activity going on uh, you know certainly with pittsburgh you know sort of led uh with carnegie mellon uh university of pittsburgh uh, the healthcare system out there you know is is led uh the state for for many years and and then philadelphia certainly became a lot more active state college um you know so we, we have tech i mean there, there's a lot there which, which really bring go ahead gad looks like you were gonna i was something. just saying like uh uh, some people in Pennsylvania um, would not view themselves as the Midwest. <laughs> but, uh, but it yeah, just still, Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia views Pittsburgh as the Midwest. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but uh, no, but uh, Pennsylvania certainly became um, a battleground uh, state, and it was safely Democrat, I would say, during the Obama years and before. Uh, but uh, so, so I think... Um, that's a very interesting one. I, I think, uh, and, and probably Chris can knows much more about it than I do, but I think the economic uh, decline of the Midwest made some of the states, especially Michigan, Wisconsin, that were more uh, safely Democrat, uh, they became battleground states. And areas like Ohio, that used to be a battleground state, now is a safely uh, a Republican. So, so that had uh, major uh, implications for the political uh, system. 
Yeah, and uh, my wife and I grew up in the in the coal regions of Pennsylvania, eastern coal regions, um, and you know it's shocking going back and looking at the hometown politics that you know it was staunch Democrat. I mean, you're you're talking coal miners, you're talking unions, uh, you're talking um, you know really blue collar jobs. And so it, it for, you know, when we grew up and, and through most of those, the following decades, it was staunchly, uh, I won't say liberal, but it was certainly Democrat. And now communities like Hazelton, Hazelton uh, Luzerne County are, you know, pretty outspoken, almost ultra right, um, you know, super conservative, um, huge, huge shifts. Uh, with, within in that, so even a microcosm of yeah. where the country is, that that's a good example. Uh, and I know we've got listeners from around the world, so some of these communities don't make sense, you know, for people. Uh, Chris, did you have something to say? No, just just it's okay. really fascinating in the way you, uh, uh, Ira and Gad, framed it. And I too am, you know, I'm I grew up just outside of Scranton, um, and all you know that experience, one of the most democratic places in the country that's seen. A shift, and ironically, it's where the president's from, right? It's his hometown. Deep, you know, democratic roots that 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 he has began there within that community. Um, but but as Gad was talking about his, his description, you know, all of this is a microcosm of Pennsylvania. Uh, all the projections, all you're talking, you started Ira with projections over the next decade. You know, Pennsylvania's um, rural center released some predictions uh, projections for this decade. Uh, in the next 20 years, actually, in terms of Pennsylvania population and the actual absolute draining of rural counties uh, in the state and in terms of population projections uh, at the same time of growth in the regions that we might describe the eastern portion, the east east coast part of the state, the southeast, including the Lehigh Valley. Um, uh, so we, we all this the, the backdrop of those issues that Gad was describing in terms of economic displacement disappointment, worry about the future, kind of this uh, this opinion of decline uh, is, is part of many of the experiences in Pennsylvania, but also uh, quite distinct from what we'd see in the growth areas of the state. In the growth areas, you know, in real numbers, the place growing the fastest over the last decade is the city of Philadelphia. Um, you know, in real numbers, percentage wise, you see some of the collar counties and places up here in the Lehigh Valley. Um, What's so important about that, uh, viewers or listeners might say, well, yeah, okay, that's a nice story for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania happens to be the premier swing state in the presidential election. It's the biggest prize up for grabs, right? Uh, and all of those dimensions uh, that we have talked about are weighing on the on the choices. And I, you know, I talked before about public opinion on how people view the future, right? How they view the economy. Uh, things that, that Gad mentioned, right? And there is this historic disconnect between macroeconomic indicators and public confidence and public views on the uh, um, on the direction of the economy. Uh, and that's against the backdrop of an election. And it's a backdrop in a place like Pennsylvania, which really complicates the dynamic. As I said before, if I was a modeler and I'd go back in history and say, well, given all the macroeconomic indicators and their predictor of, of electoral fortunes, this one's done, right? And assuming we're on the same trajectory, you know, I'll take Gad's point, you know, maybe you don't want to be overly optimistic, right? Things could still uh, affect uh, this year, but let's assume it's 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 kind of headed the way it is. Um, it, it just doesn't simply work in a in a world right now that I think has some disrupted um, um, uh, dynamics going on. <laughs> I would say, if I, get, I, I think another interesting thing that happens and 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 contributed to the shift in in the Midwest and other uh, swing states is that um, I would say during the Obama years it wasn't clear which party is the party of the elites and which party is the party of the people. Like you, Mitt Romney and uh, McCain, they were as elite, if not more, than Obama. Uh, but um, I think now it's there is much more clear alignment of like the elite with the Democrats and the people. Uh, the I would say the, the let's say uh, the blue color people uh, with the with the Republicans and and uh, that I think contributed to this uh, shift, especially in the Midwest. 
let's try to pull this back um, a, a little bit, I guess, is what are the consequences of all this? Where, where do we go since this is about the future of work? You know, where, where, what does this look like five or 10 years from now? And, and again, my one of, part, part of what we're, you know, we talk about a lot here is, is jobs in, labor, in the labor market. So it's a little bit different. Um, you know, one of the stats that that uh, has, that I've been thrown out for quite a while, and in my some of the research probably came from GAD as well, uh, is, is that if you look at the trends uh, going back when the baby boomers entered the market, you know, the largest generation ever, um, we were creating two and a half million. There were, well, it wasn't new jobs, but there was two and a half million new people, potential workers, coming into the workforce every year. So for 20 years, that was, and, and then we hit uh, Gen X, uh, which was about half the size uh, of that. So just for reference, Gen X sort of born 1965, 1980-ish, give, give that period of time. But it was about half the size of the boomers, but the economy slowed. It was the 80s. Uh, so when they started to enter the workforce, uh, it, it wasn't that impactful. Uh, and we didn't notice that. Plus, the baby boomers were still aging and there was still this wave of baby boomers. So we still we dropped from about two and a half million new potential bodies, new workers, plus immigration, <laughs> plus immigration. Um, that was just births uh, that we had. And then um, it, it, it escalated again with the millennials and we're back to about two and a half million potential workers. With our birth rate, and limited immigration, we're down, uh, and I know some of the stats said, we're down to under 500,000 new potential workers while the baby boomers are retiring, slowing down, aging, dying. Um, and there's a, and the young generation that's coming in has a whole different outlook on work. So when we talk about tight labor markets, I, I I'm not seeing how that changes. So going to the future, I'd, I'd like to hear your commentary on that. Um, and, you know, what what's the in, and, and then we'll, when we come back after the, the break, we'll weave in the elephant in the room, which is AI. You know, we, we talk about people are saying, I need work. We need work. We need different work. We need more work. We need higher wages. And now we got and 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 Gad and I are talking about this limited, this tight labor market. They say, okay, so why isn't all this possible? It should be the other way around. Empl employers should be screaming, we'd need workers. Um, so a lot of confusion. So I'll, I'll let you comment on that. And then we'll take a short break and then we'll come back and, and we'll dig into AI for a, a little bit. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you want to lead off? You know what? I, I think Gad, Gad probably could, could offer much more on the- Okay. On the, all right. That's right. Okay. Gad. Um, but, go ahead. Oh, Gad, no, no, no. Please, Chris. I, I please finish here. Yeah. No, I know the one thing I will say it is, I mean, you laid it out so well, you framed it um, Ira, as a political pollster might say uh, for a way that, that we could think about, you know, and I'm obviously thinking through a, you know, political lens, a labor market and how, how this affects our political views, our, our desires, our, our views on what the system should do. And that's, those are big ticket items that I don't, you know, we don't have time right now, maybe after the break. Um, but, but certainly, right. You do hear and looking at, at polls of, of, of businesses about the labor market, those fears, right? And also the desire for policies that might allow that to happen. I mean, and, and certainly immigration is a gigantic issue in this election cycle um, in how it is looked and how it's viewed. And you see tons of nuance, right? You know, traditionally businesses, how they might view uh, immigration and, and versus uh, some other kind of cultural aspects of it. Uh, and it is a, a complex dynamic that's going to going to really play out over the next decade. But Gad, please. I, you know, I just uh, since we we're talking about immigration, I'll just say that by not solving the uh, border crisis, in fact, we have the most influential immigration policy in many years. And the, I think it's underreported how many new immigrants joined the labor force in the last two, three years. And you know, you, there are all those asylum seekers that come to the border and they are let in and they are released and they, in a few months, they have a right to work. I'm not saying if it's good or bad, I'm just describing the, the labor market impact. 
And after a while, they do start working. And I'm sure many of the illegal immigrants are also starting to work at some point. So we had a massive uh, inflow, which I think part of the reason why the labor market loosened a little, especially labor market for uh, kind of uh, less skilled workers, uh, really loosened in, in the last uh, year or two. Uh, and uh, uh, an underreported factor is the massive immigration that uh, that occurred during that uh, that time. So, um, yeah, I, and doesn't seem that it's going to change much anytime soon uh, with the failure to reach a, a, an immigration deal. Uh, so um, that, that's an, an important, uh, not I would say not a game changer, but uh, a game uh, mini changer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the pre-game show, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, listening to Geek Excuses and Googleization. we got a lot more to, to go. Well, we have some more to go, um, but we're going to take a, a quick break here. I want to thank Gad Levinen and Chris uh, Boric uh, for joining us. We've been a great conversation. When we come back, we're going to really dig in a little bit more with AI because um, ChatGPT came out, um, you know, which is a small fraction of, of everything that's going on in AI. Uh, but the, the economy is just going crazy. I mean, there's, you know, if you're in a semi, if you were in the right semiconductor stocks, you know, you've made 600% money in the, since the beginning of the year. We're only five weeks into it. Um, and, you know, crazy, crazy gains there. Um, so is this a, you know, is this going to be a bust? But AI is certainly not going away. Toothpaste out of the tube. Bad news for folks that think we got to slow it down, regulate it, control it. Uh, public public policy, because of a slow pace, just missed, missed the boat. And we're still trying to figure out social media. And that's been around for 20 years. Uh, so, uh, having congressional hearings on what to do about social media. Uh, and uh, so we, we've got we've got a lot. Unfortunately, uh, we, we only have a few minutes left when we come back for the break. So I'm going to stop talking and uh, we're going to go to our commercial. We'll be back in one minute. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5-10 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. Everyone, welcome back to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We've got Gad Levinen, Chief Economist at Burning Glass Institute, Chris Boric, uh, who's Director of uh, Public Opinion. I keep saying public policy, but it's Director of the Institute of Public Opinion at Muhlenberg College. Uh, when we left off, we we're talking about the labor markets. So, uh, but we're also, want to, I want to integrate AI. I mean, it's the, uh, it's, it's more than the elephant in the room. It's a whole, it's a whole family of elephants uh, that are in the room. Um, we, we knew it was coming, uh, right? It's, it's all right before the pandemic, and, and we've had this pandemic thrown into this mix of everything. Uh, but right before the pandemic, uh, just a few months before, uh, at the uh, Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce, um, we had a Future of Work Summit. It was Future of Work 2030, and I gave the keynote there. And I talked about what things were going to look like in 2030, and then, bam, six months later, you know, here we are. So we, we sort of missed the deck. We missed our projection by a decade, um, but we're we're living within that. Uh, we, I think we missed the projection on the AI. We, we thought this was going to be a kind of a linear, gradual rollout. And chat GPT shows up and all of a sudden it blows up. It's not only in the consumer's hands, but it seems like every industry, every business uh, probably combined with the labor market. So let's talk a little bit about um, Gad, maybe the impact that you're going to, that we should expect to see with AI on the labor markets, um, you know, Chris, you know, certainly on the election, uh, but on the future, uh, you know, re, re, you know, on, on the future as well, uh, future of work, um, you know, what your take is on that. So let's start with, with Gad, um, you know, wh where are you seeing the impact? I mean, it, is, is the fear of 
we're going to wipe out. I mean, I don't see it that way, but the dystopian view is it's going to eliminate all these jobs. It's going to change jobs, but it, it, are, are we going to go through the traditional um, outcome where there's just millions of new jobs? Well, so, you know, in, in the past 10, 20 years, quietly but surely a lot of uh, like millions of uh, clerical and office support jobs were eliminated um, and it didn't make the news that much yeah, but bank tellers it, you know and was like atms are going to get rid of all the bank teller jobs well it, it, it didn't at the beginning but eventually now we have yeah. half of the number of bank bank tellers that we used to so I think uh, what will happen is a continuation of that, perhaps a little faster, um, and perhaps more importantly, it won't be just clerical and office support. It will move up to the more the white color professionals, uh, and uh, we will see that. But it's not necessarily going to um, uh, happen through uh, massive layoffs. Uh, you, you know, even if a company wants to reduce its workforce in a certain uh, role, they don't need to uh, fire a lot of people immediately. They can um, just uh, stop hiring for that uh, those roles and let attrition do, do its job. Uh, and after a while, you'll see a significant reduction. I, I think we will see a, a lot of that. I do believe that it's a big deal that uh, the technological... Um, uh, improvement here is real and eventually there will be much uh, fewer jobs in, in many uh, occupations that are highly exposed to to AI. But yeah, I, yeah go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I think one of the things that, that's there is, is that one of the stats is that two-thirds of all jobs will be one-third automated or changed, re requiring Two thirds of, and that that just doesn't include. I mean, at one time when we talked about automation, it was a blue collar, it was a line worker, mm -hmm. and, and now we're talking about, you know, we're we're talking everything from doctors, attorneys, accountants, uh, professors. Uh, you know, I mean, every industry is going to be affected, and it doesn't mean it's going to eliminate those jobs, but it's going to change those jobs. Everyone is going to have to to learn. It, it doesn't mean that everybody can work two thirds of the time. I know that's the abundance theory and the singularity theory that you know we'll only have to work twenty hours a week and and everybody will be able to thrive. You know, the the reality is is that we're still going to have these forty and fifty hour weeks that we all put in uh, to get paid. But part of but what we do is going to change, and how we get our work done is going to get changed. So that to me is, is the scariest part of creating this class of people who just says, I'm too old to learn how to do this, or they don't have an opportunity to learn, you know, some of these new skills. Um, Chris, what, where, where, where is AI affecting your world oh, other, than, yeah. other than misinformation? <laughs> so, and so many, and in the mis misinformation, one of the big components, right? Uh, and it is so challenging. And I love, I'm certainly not the, the expert that both of you are in terms of the labor markets, but, you know, thinking it from a, in my field, public opinion uh, uh, research, uh, enormous when we're at our conferences, uh, amount of attention paid to AI and how that either fits in as a, um, a, a benefit, a complement to the work, a substitute for the work, all the things that we could think about. Um, it's so, and then, as you know, Ira, in, our, in the education field, right, um, uh, as you mentioned, you professors among the occupations, you know, not only, you know, how we, we embrace um, AI within our pedagogy or try to limit AI within our pedagogy, uh, but also in what we actually do, the, the, the performance. So I think the big, the big challenge is going to be for everyone across industries, including the ones that I'm part of, is to identify the, the human value added components, right? What can AI, what will AI do? What will humans, what value do they add specifically that AI can't capture and how do we weave those things together? So it's, it's a, incredibly dynamic kind of moment right for er everything and I, I i certainly don't have a ton of answers um in the electoral process in the political area which i i spend my time thinking about certainly ai is already we've seen it enter into um uh campaigns uh and 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 in the way that people are worried about the most nefarious ways right with ai generated messaging and calls and um 
you know, the, the, the Biden in New Hampshire already. We've seen that as an example that there'll just be more of that. Uh, yeah, the big I, I guess the good news is it creates it means we're creating jobs, for, 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 <laughs> well, you know, for people either creating it or uncovering it or protecting it. Or, right, and that is you're right. And it's, it's not it's not <laughs> trivial. Right. On both sides and who it replaces. And, and but it is new, new opportunities and new regulatory. And, and from my perspective, the thing that I'm really fascinated and I think the challenge is, is the regulatory uh, structures, uh, infrastructure to, to deal with this, right? And how we will deal with that on an electoral process. Imagine elections, right, where they might be majorly affected. And this is not kind of scare tactics, but, you know, some on election day, uh, a, a really successful AI generated campaign that dissuades voters from showing up for various reasons, right? That are, that's believable. And how we might deal with that through our laws that are, are simply not designed for that. So major challenges ahead. I'm, I'm optimistic they could be addressed. Uh, politics moves glacially compared to all the other things that you uh, you folks are studying uh, and looking at. Um, but but ultimately, it, it can find ways to, to at least uh, buffer some of the, the most challenging aspects of it. You know, I, I have a potential uh, theory uh, I'm curious what, what you think about that, Chris. Uh, so, you know, in the past, uh, the people who were kind of left behind were mostly people without a college degree because their um, jobs were most impacted. I wonder if with the generative AI, the group of the left behind will grow and a few of the college grads will join them because now they will be left behind. Their jobs will be uh, significantly impacted. So kind of the pool of the people who are left behind is going to become uh, larger and larger. It, 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 and a different demographic, right? I mean, that's fascinating. We've seen the shift kind of, as, as we talked about earlier in the show, of, of the populist ascension uh, in the Trump era and the Republican Party, right? And, and the push to the Democratic Party of higher educated, wealthier um elites, if, if you will, away from the Republican Party. So you see these shifts going on. And, and often, historically, we've seen labor markets and labor challenges uh, reorientate political alliances, right, over time, these realignments that we have. And, and absolutely, I mean, if you see a major disruption in terms of, of economics uh, driven by AI among that, that cohort that we're talking about of, of higher educated uh, professionals, uh, you could, you could, I'm, I'm going to use the word strange bedfellows, but you can create some really kind of aligned, uh, groups politically that, that might have some transformative properties within the, within the electoral process. Unfortunately, we are coming up to the end of the show because I could go, we, we can go on. I've got at least nine more questions here, but uh, so I, hopefully we'll be able to carve some time out and get you guys back, uh, you know, during during the course of the year and, and get some progress on that. Um, but I, we, I, there's two things I'd like to do the our lightning round. Uh, I want to give you guys an opportunity how people can reach out to you as well. So let's do those together and in the sake of time. Um, so Chris, um, my, my question for you is, uh, in our lightning round is something to get a little bit more personal about you. Uh, what, what's something that people often get wrong about you and how can they reach you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, what, what, one is that, that I, I, I follow, uh, politics nonstop, right. That I, I know I'd, I go home. Well, we know and, that about you. <laughs> yeah, and all I do is watch watch every show, and I know every every bit of of, of information. Uh, so I'm I, I'm hopefully uh, once I, once I leave, I, I spend more time you know running or watching Philly sports uh, than I do just simply watching uh, cable news. Uh, so and you can get it. I'm very easily uh, reached. Um, you can reach me right through the Institute of Public Opinions, easily uh, found uh, with a, a simple search. Um, and uh, I, I, I try to be as responsive as, as, as possible. So I'm hopefully yeah. very easily reached. I'm, I'm sure you'll be quite. Light. I could have been more lightning with that. Right. We, we could, you'll be quite busy this year. So we'll, we'll give you a little leeway in, in getting back to us. Uh, we will also put the links, I'll put a few links into the, into the, uh, into the show notes. Gad, um, same thing. What, what's something people don't, that often get wrong about you? You know, it's, I don't know what people think about me, so I don't know if they get it wrong <laughs> or right. Uh, I guess I am um, 
not a typical economist in my uh, nature and behavior. So uh, that's uh, maybe one thing that people have like this uh, image of uh, economists. Um, how to reach me? I, I'm, as you mentioned earlier, I, I'm very active on uh, on um, LinkedIn, uh, and I, you know, I, I work for a relatively new organization, uh, the Burning Glass Institute, and I encourage everyone to uh, check us out and uh, look at uh, what we're doing in, on our uh, website. So maybe we can put that later on as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you, you you guys do some incredible work, and I highly recommend. Uh, you know, connecting with uh, Gad up on on LinkedIn, and and he's kind of active. I mean, you 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 are always interacting with everybody, and there's some super smart people up there, uh, especially when we're talking about the labor markets. And sometimes it gets a little, you know, economic-y geeky, but <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, I would I would put you in the category of the uh, you know the stereotypical, uh, although you're not an accountant, but the the uh, extroverted accountants, the extroverted economists, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, again, I appreciate uh, both of you taking time out of your, your busy schedules, uh, crazy, crazy parts of the year. Um, so many other things to, to be able to chat about and, and hopefully that will be able to get you back on. Hopefully everybody enjoyed uh, the show today. The first uh, next week, uh, we've we, this month, we've got some great guests. And again, on the new format uh, next week, uh, we have uh, uh, someone called her name is Jody Paydar. Um, she is really uh, looking at what accounting, we're, we're going to be talking about what accounting is going to look like uh, in the future of work. So we got Bill Keller, who is a global, uh, he has a global staffing firm, uh, and he works with the, almost exclusively with the counting, with businesses helping them with their accounting. Uh, and then Jody uh, is really a, almost a futurist in, in that regard about the accounting, but uh, many of the trends there will fall that over. Following week, we got uh, our two favorite neuroscientists back, or two of our neuroscientists back, uh, and what the effect is going to uh, of work and people is going to be on that. So we got Paul Zach and Zach Mercurio, and then we have the ODN Capital Group at the end of the month. So we'll be talking about the economy again. So appreciate everybody. Uh, stay being part of that again. You can download the W4CY app, uh, or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Ira Wolf. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, let's go to Apple, Spotify, Roku, where, wherever we're, we're everywhere. Uh, again, thanks for being part of Googleization Nation. If you haven't joined yet, please do. It's free. Just go to googleizationnation.com. Uh, I want to extend a special thanks to both Gad and Chris uh, for being here today, our listeners for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed uh, to us on your platform, if you listen to us, please do so. Leave a review. And until next time, don't let the ship your plan. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.